Oh, hello. Sorry, I was just doing a little light reading. Today, we are going to talk about optical illusions. Many of the illusions we see today are created simply by how our brain has learned to process information. Take these next illusions as an example. Right now, while you're watching me, your brain has already analyzed the fact that in comparison to my surroundings, I'm about six foot, six foot one feet tall. And while you're viewing that, you realize that if I moved, like per se, way over here, your brain would have already analyzed that when I moved that way, I was still six foot, about six one feet tall, compared to what was around me back there. You can tell that as everything else gets smaller, I will too. That's why when these 2D lines are placed in a 3D world, you interpret it one, the line further back, much larger than the line closer to you. See, relative to everything around it, the line farther down looks much bitter, bigger. But in reality, the two lines are the same size. Because we live and perceive things in the 3D world, even if a shape casts a different image on our retina, then we still know it is the same shape and the same size. Take this door, for example. You can see it's a rectangle. When I open it, cast more, more of a sideways trapezoid image on your retina, but you still know it's a rectangle. Because this fits in our schemas as a three-dimensional door, we see it as a rectangle. Clearly, it is actually a trapezoid. Your mind uses grouping principles to organize visual information, kind of like schemas. These are the principles. First is proximity. We group things that are near together, together, or if there's two, as a pair. The second is similarity. We group two things that are similar to together as each other in a group. If we have two smiling people, and two angry people, we'll group them in two separate categories. The third is con continuity. We perceive patterns that are smooth and run altogether the same, rather than ones that are chopped. The fourth is connectedness. This means we perceive two things that are linked as a single unit. Finally, we have closure, where we'll, where we'll take an object that might have been severed or blocked by something and turn it into a whole, continued piece. Hi there. You must be thinking, wow, Garrick, you're really tall to fit across that entire tree. But I'm not that tall. This is just a prime example of connectedness. Because you see one set of legs and one torso, you assume they are connected. That's not the case. It was two people the whole time. Hey, here I am in a tree. You hear those birds? Uh, listen to those birds. They aren't really birds, though. They're not in this tree. They're just coming from Milo's computer. What you saw with Garrick and the birds was what, what is considered an auditory illusion. Not all illusions are visual. You see, you misinterpreted the stimulus. What you thought were birds coming from outside were actually birds coming from the... That may seem like a lame illusion, but it's an illusion nonetheless. And think that's all? Well, right now, you're interpreting the sound coming out of the computer speakers as sound coming out of my mouth. But since it's not actually coming my, out of my mouth, even though they belong together, that is considered an auditory illusion. Which line appears bigger, line A or line B? My guess is that you're going to say line B, but that's in part because of your culture and how you were raised. The lines are actually the same size. <laughs> That corner there? That's the corner that's farther away. That's why the lines at the end, as you can see, jut outwards, like arrow B in the illusion. But the arrows on this outward pointing corner, which then appears closer to you, go inward, as you can see on the edge here. The Muller liar illusion works in part because we've been raised in a rectangular environment. When they surveyed rural Africans who live in circular huts like the ones shown behind me, they were much less susceptible to this illusion. Binocular cues aid our vision and allow us to see as well as we do. One of these is retinal disparity, a great tool, but it can be tricked. For example, have you ever been really bored in class or Paris and you have a finger or your pen and you close one eye and you pretend it's like a missile or a big tool that you can use to smash someone's head and you crush the other students with it. 
Well, while you're flicking Mr. Williams' head off, you, you're closing one eye due to retinal disparity. Retinal disparity does the following. Having two eyes allows you to see the world from two different views. Your brain then takes these two, two views and interprets them into one, and it allows you to perceive depth. Do you remember the two lines on the railroad we saw earlier? Well, you saw them like that because there were 2D images on a 3D world. So, back to the finger. When you close one eye, you lose binocular cues and rely on monocular cues, which are not as efficient at perceiving depth. This is why we can better imagine our finger as a weapon of mass destruction when one eye is closed. There is a problem with retinal disparity, though. When an object gets too close, it interferes with how you perceive it. Here's an example that you're probably familiar with that is also a kind of illusion. When you put your fingers a few inches from your eyes, like this, a small finger sausage, like the one you're seeing, will appear. Oh, hey. So, I guess we should explain that last illusion. Mm -hmm. When your finger is near your eye, both your eyes, once again, see different views, but now that it's close enough, the views are different enough that it's hard for your brain to compute them as one image. So when they're crossed, you end up with a little extra finger of each one. It's really weird. It is. Oh, well, it seems that's all the time we have for today. But if you'd like to find out more, you can visit your local library. Case closed.